My friends, tonight we're gonna try something a little different. A week ago we painted and pre-weathered this BMR3M mine clearing vehicle and the point of this approach was to create the basic concept of weathering, so we could have a better idea about the model once it's finished. And of course it saves us time, because we already know which parts are gonna be covered in dust and mud for example, but now? Now it's time to try something I like to call non-linear weathering. It's a working title. Let's start with mine rollers, because they're more faded, and it's much easier to experiment on something that's supposed to be heavily weathered. Well, to be honest, I already did one of them off screen, so I'll show it to you on the other one. But the cool thing is, I managed to do it all in one session. I'll be very brief with the individual techniques, because I want to show you the overall workflow, and we'll talk about each method in more detail while I'm painting and weathering the vehicle itself later in the video. I'll just be more specific on this heavily rusted out part, because my patrons wanted to see the process in detail. So here goes. A dark grey base coat which I'm applying with a sponge, because it's quick and it's easier to create some visual texture with it. Lighter tone of grey will add even more texture, and since I was already working with a grey color, I also painted the electrical cables and bumper stops. Now we can add heavy enamel rust washes. I'm applying them with the so-called wet blending technique, which means I'm mixing them together before they dry. Super fast and easy method, just two layers of random grey colors followed by a random rust wash and you have a pretty convincing rusted out surface. But the rusting process continues. Because I had a good reference photo, I knew the entire front section will be heavily corroded. And because of this, I don't have to waste time with pin washes or fine chipping work. Just a heavy rust wash blended with enamel thinner, that's all. This is just the first step in the entire non-linear approach. So if you have a clear idea about a specific part, just focus on that and get it done. Now I want to show you the overall approach and the reasoning behind it. So, normally I'd start with a pin wash, but I decided to get all the acrylic work out of the way first. I'm starting with sponge chipping, because it's my greatest weakness, so getting it out of the way first is a huge relief. Also, there will be several layers on top, which will refine it into a pretty nice result. Once the basic layout is done, I can proceed with dark grey steel chips. Using a sponge for the initial layer has a lot of benefits. Obviously it's very fast, but it also leads to many happy accidents. Even if some patches look real bad, they can be easily transformed into interesting effects. Not to mention, another accidental benefit is how you can easily create different intensities. I for example managed to apply heavier chipping on this roller compared to the other one, which is pretty cool of course. Weld beads deserve some chipping as well, after all I spent time sculpting them from epoxy putty, so it would be a real shame if I left them unnoticed. Focusing on just one medium, in this case acrylic paints, has its time saving benefits. For example, cleaning brushes, opening and closing different bottles, it, it all takes time. I did all of this with a wet palette and a cup of tap water. Well, except the steel chipping where I used a regular palette, but still. It makes for a much smoother workflow. Also, acrylics usually come in hand with more precise techniques such as chipping and detail painting, and now we can look forward to more relaxing enamel effects. I started with a pin wash, because it nicely outlines all details. It also helps to refine sloppy detail painting. For example, I made a few accidental brush strokes while painting the stainless steel cable socket, but a pin wash will easily fix that. These rollers are also pretty small, so I could apply the wash over the whole part and not work in sections like I usually do. I was also much more relaxed while I was cleaning it, because we have pre-weathering and pre-dusting underneath. So I used it to create some subtle stains here and there, especially in those places where lots of dirt is accumulated. And I finished it off with rust washes. This is the same approach like usual, applying them in small amount over most of the chips and then carefully blending them. Again, I could be more at ease because these parts are old and heavily rusted. Needless to say, I applied them right after I was done with the pin wash, meaning it wasn't fully dry yet. 
but because rust effects are applied in a more controlled manner, it wasn't a big deal. For example, if I went the other way, starting with rust effects and then following with a pin wash, I'd wipe a lot of them away. Also worth noting is how the pin wash toned down the silver chipping over weld beads, which is another nice benefit of this approach. And this is the last effect I added to them, but obviously just for now. I still have to finish the dust and mud tones. But this is the one thing I wasn't completely sure about, so instead I'll move on on the BMR and get it done, so to say, in the same manner, and then we'll finish the entire model in the next episode with dust and mud. I hope this explanation made at least some kind of sense. It probably seems all over the place compared to the more traditional approach, but when you think about it from perspective of time and efficiency, it kinda makes sense, doesn't it? Anyway, time for the BMR and let's talk about each technique in more detail. Again, I wanted to get most of the acrylic work out of the way first. It's sometimes ridiculous how many details you can paint in different variations of dark grey. Here for example I'm painting the contact surfaces of wheels and thus preparing them for final layers of mud effects. T80 tracks also have rubber padding on the inside, but first I sanded the metal contact points such as guide horns and ice cleats with a file, revealing the shiny metal underneath the paint. Then I quickly dry brushed the rubber pads with the same grey color. More grey details include the massive electric cables, which I painted in a slightly lighter tone, and also larger unpainted steel surfaces. A slightly darker tone was used on headlights and optics. Of course this is just a base coat for additional effects, which we're gonna look at in the moment. The cord machine gun was painted in the same dark grey color. It's a good choice when you combine it with a black-brown wash and some metallic polishing later on. The ammo belt... well... I don't have a good color for this, so I used a gold Tamiya color. Not the greatest choice, but uh, fair enough, I think. And the metal belt was again painted in dark grey. Now for all the glass parts. This kit comes with clear parts for these, but I don't like masking and I find it just overall much less painful to just paint them by brush. So they all received a layer of wet effects fluid which makes the headlights glossy and protects the other parts from aggressive Tamiya clear paints. Brake lights were treated with clear red, position lights with clear green, the driver's vision block with clear yellow, and the commander's optics with clear blue. Going back to water-based acrylics, the ammunition can handles were picked out with old wood, which works pretty well for these leather or fabric belts, and the real treat was this spent casing pouch. Details like this need to be painted in a similar way like stowage or, or figures, but I decided to try a more efficient method. After base coating it with a mixture of buff and Russian uniform, I laid down the highlights, mixed from the same colors but with more buff added. Instead of gradually building them up like I did on my first figure, I painted them in a single pass. This means lots of contrast but very sharp and unnatural color transitions. Same with the shadows, where I used pure Russian uniform. The magic step is glazing with the original base coat. You just have to apply several glazes of extremely diluted paint which will tone down the contrasting colors. Unfortunately, I didn't film everything because it was quite uncomfortable, but here I for example added sewing details. First I outlined the edges with Russian uniform and then I added small dots of buff in regular intervals. Not too shabby in my opinion, it just needs more work and learning in the future, but I feel like this is a really good and efficient technique. Anyway, now I deviated from my approach. If we take the minor rollers as a some kind of guide, I should now continue with chipping. At first I didn't even know why I decided to continue with the pin wash, but I think it's because there was just too much detail work on the vehicle and I just wanted to take a small break from all the precise brush painting. And to change things up even more, I used a different color here. Actually, not just color, but also the medium. After all, like I said in one of the Yak Tiger videos, oil paints are actually slightly better than enamels when it comes to pin washes because they blend into a smoother finish. This time I needed the pin wash to dry quickly, so I mixed the paint with Oil Expert from VMS. 
These new 502 Abteilung are slightly more oily than the old ones and such they need to be drained on a piece of napkin or cardboard. Ideally for I'd say about an hour and then you can mix them into a wash. This was overall a very pleasant experience. These modern vehicles are just full of surface details so there's plenty of stuff to work with. And we can also change the intensity. For example a deep gap between reactive armor blocks can have a much darker wash than let's say an indentation on a fender. And because oil paints are easier to blend into fake shadows and random stains of dirt, they work beautifully with the pre-weathered base coat. As soon as the pin wash was done it was back to acrylics. This time I started with aluminum chips on fenders. Because remember, modern Russian tanks have storage boxes and external fuel tanks made from aluminum. Metallic paints are overall more difficult to brush paint in a controlled manner. And I wasn't happy with the result in some places, but remember, there's the ultimate trick with a toothpick. Just a slight rub and the paint will peel off in a random way, resulting in a nice and sharp chipping. And the same thing for weld beads, but I made extra sure to only chip those which are very exposed and the crew often walks over them. I also added a few random chips on the rubber flaps. These were painted with the rest of the vehicle, but exposing the original rubber surface here and there is a nice way to show the different material. And to also remind everyone that you do in fact know that these are made from rubber on the real vehicle. The light chipping underneath was created with a sponge, which we're gonna do right now. I ended up mixing a pretty weird color from USA uniform and buff, but you know, then again the base color on this vehicle is quite unique and unusual as well. It's very deep, rich and it has this slight blue tint or something. So what's the difference to all my previous sponge chipping attempts? Well, I think it's mainly that I used a sponge and sponge only. Previously I liked to go over these chips with a paintbrush using the same color and refine them, but this always ended in long hours spent outlining every edge of the model and in fact every tiny detail as well. The result was often quite uniform and like actually not random at all if I'm being honest, so yeah, this was all done in about 20 minutes and although my sponge mastery is at level 1, at least I have a random base layer for the steel chips. These were painted the same way like on the mine rollers or any of my previous models in fact. So with a mixture of white and dark grey and some VMS drying retarder added so the paint would remain workable for longer. This is very important because when you're literally dancing over the surface with a small paintbrush for extended periods of time, there's nothing more annoying than interrupting your workflow every minute or so to clean it and start over again. The brush I'm still using is the good old Vallejo Kolinsky triple zero. I mean, I've been using it for years by now and it's still kicking. I also wanted to be more restrained on this model because these vehicles are usually not beaten up like at all, but I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> Yet overall I think the amount of chipping is still quite limited and also focused on the most exposed sections, which is a small win on its own isn't it? <laughs> maybe, okay maybe except the era blocks. I should keep it more subtle there, but it's it's hard to resist with all of these exposed edges. Moving on, my chipping is never finished unless it has some rust washes on top. This is an excellent way to make the effect look more subtle, because the rust wash nicely blends it with the rest of the surface. It just has to be applied in a controlled manner, so small dots over individual chips, not one heavy layer over the entire vehicle. like obviously. <laughs> and when you start blending them, the subtle effect slowly starts coming to life. It also nicely tones down the light superficial chipping, creating this like subtle faded look. One more thing I noticed is that rust washes work much better over green finishes. The effect gives the surface more depth and visual interest. For example, light colored finishes such as German dark yellow or winter whitewash, these are very difficult in comparison and I often find myself going over the blended rust wash several times until, you know, it's toned down to a more natural looking result. 
Raw steel details are treated the same way like at the very beginning of the video. The light rust wash and streaking rust effects are applied simultaneously and wet blended while they're still active. It's a very straightforward method with pretty convincing results. We can also vary the amount of rust depending on the part we're working on. For example, the storage racks for mine rollers are prone to some heavier chipping, which I already applied, but knowing their intended purpose, I can blend the rust wash a little bit less, so I'm leaving more of the rusty paint visible. Conversely, armored plates which are worn down by foot traffic can be treated more sparingly, just to give them a slightly faded steel effect with barely noticeable rust zones here and there. The final chipping work was done on the lock at the back. Most of the time it's painted with the rest of the vehicle, but I wanted to emphasize its woodiness. Woodiness. I hope that's a word. So I pretty much highlighted its texture with Vallejo Old Wood. It's not really chipping per se, but it's more like just highlighting. But yeah, it makes the lock look more faded and worn down. And of course, now it looks like I didn't forget about it. <laughs> Anyway, my friends, this is unfortunately all I managed to do this week, but just think about it. This is all I managed to do in one week. Actually, it was five days because I'm leaving one or two days for video editing, but seriously, five days for detail painting, pin washes, chipping and rust effects on a big chunks like this. I mean, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Theoretically, we could call it a day and consider the model finished, but... <laughs> Let's be honest, there's a bunch of stuff that's really just not finished. Like tracks, road wheels, mine rolling wheels, I barely touched these. Also, the mine rollers are just dry fitted for the sake of presentation, so they're a little bit wobbly. And I'm gonna disassemble the model right after I'm done here. So we'll have to keep the rest for the next week. And I think that's gonna be the grand final of this project. 135th scale modern vehicle finished in 4 episodes. That's a pretty good start for the year, if I'm being like completely honest. So what do you think? I feel like doing some loose ground debris, some torn vegetation, dry mud, wet mud, some water effects, maybe a piece of random stowage for some splash of color or something, um, antennas of course. We'll see. I think it's gonna be worth it. So I hope this video made sense and you enjoyed it. I'm just, really I'm just trying different approaches because like I already mentioned, I want to finish models more quickly and efficiently this year without sacrificing too much quality. Somehow I feel like it's working so far, but let's not jump to conclusions before the model is finished. Anyway. Thank you my friends for dropping by, if you like what you saw, leave me a like and a comment, dislike if you didn't like it, and I can't forget about my amazing patrons who make this weekly show possible. Patreon is the best place where you can not only support me, but also get lots of stuff in return. Like I said at the beginning of the video, my patrons wanted to see the rusting process in detail. So I filmed it in detail. But you can also get lots of updates from all my projects which I post almost every day. We can also get in touch through DMs, you can watch videos one week early without any ads so you could finish this one and start watching the final weathering episode, and you can also get these very nice studio pictures in full resolution and download them as your own references. So yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you again my friends, stay safe, stay awesome, have fun and a great week, and I'll see you the next Friday. Cheers my friends.